I sincerely welcome everyone to Sri Radha Gopinath Temple, especially my very dear senior god brother Nara Narayan Prabhu, very close associate of Srila Prabhupada. Let us welcome him very enthusiastically back to our humble temple. And I believe Sukavaha Devi Prabhu is also somewhere here. Are you downstairs? Well, let us welcome her so she can hear us wherever she may be. Today, according to our Vaishnav calendar, it is the disappearance day of Udharandat Thakur. With your permission, I will speak a few words about him. Do I have your permission? With your permission comes your blessings, and with your blessings, the empowerment for me to speak. It is a divine reality that is beyond the purview of the mind senses or intelligence to comprehend how Krishna can work. If the audience is eager to hear about Krishna, to purify their hearts, Krishna can speak through someone who may not be so qualified just to deliver all of you. Krishna's ways are transcendentally perfect. Srila Prabhupada as we were speaking during the book distribution marathon festival. He was saying to the assembly of his devotees how thankful he was to them. And he said, because you are helping me to execute the order of my students, the mission of my spiritual master, I consider all of you the representatives of my Guru Maharaj. And with a choked voice, he extended his sincerest, most profound and humble gratitude. Whenever Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears within this world, once in a day of Brahma, with him comes Lord Nityananda Prabhu. And 
his eternal associates, so many of them from Goloka Vrindavan. Narutam Das Thakur has sung Brajandra Nandana Jai Sachi Shuta Hoilo Say Balaram Hoilo Nitai that the son of Nanda has appeared as the son of Sachi and Balaramji has come as Lord Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu's mercy is beyond any other avatar. Parama Karuna Pahundui Jana Nitai Gora Chandra. These two lords, Chaitanya and Nityananda Prabhu, they are supremely kind, supremely merciful. Aha Prabhu Nityananda Premananda Suki, Narottam Das Thakur sings. Nityananda Prabhu is always intoxicated in praying or ecstatic love. He is the source of the Purusha avatars, Karuna Dakshai Vishnu, Kshiro Dakshai Vishnu, Garbo Dakshai Vishnu, as well as Shesha and Mula Sankarshan. Well, when he appears, just like Balaramji would become intoxicated when taking his Varuni, Nityananda Prabhu was constantly intoxicated with the ecstasy of love of God, especially as he would glorify Lord Chaitanya by chanting his holy names. Because of this intoxicated state, he made no distinction between who was good and who was bad. People who have mundane intoxication, you know how they lose their discrimination? Sometimes very proper lords and ladies from very high cultured families, they act like complete fools when they're intoxicated. They just lose their discrimination. Well, that is a very gross, perverted reflection. But Nityananda Prabhu, he was so intoxicated with Krishna Prem, he did not discriminate who was fit or who was unfit. Anyone who took shelter of him, he would give the highest perfection of life. And he offered that shelter to everyone. On Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's order, he and Haridas Thakur, they were going from house to house, shop to shop, bathing God to bathing God, person to person, pleading with everyone to take the name of Lord Chaitanya, to chant Hare Krishna and become perfect. And anyone who took shelter with some faith, that's all he asked for. Just take shelter with some faith and I will give you the highest perfection. Dina hina yata chilo hari namu dharilo tara sakshi jagai madhai. He even gave to jagai and madhai. They were so drunk, so drunk on liquor. Very horrible. Mode of ignorance. They were murderers, thieves, rapists. They were burning houses down. They were killing cows with their own hands and just eating the flesh and putting it in their mouths. They were horrible demons. When Nityananda Prabhu approached Jagai and Madhai, all the people around warned him. They screamed at him, No, you are a fool. Don't go near them. They will kill you. Don't not listen. What nonsense. You're going to preach to them? But he could, when he heard all of that, he thought, oh, the more he heard how horrible they were, 
how dangerous they were, how sinful they were, the more enthused he was. The more he was told, you're going to die if you approach them, the more he was eager to approach them. That was Nityananda Prabhu. And along with Lord Nityananda Prabhu came his eternal associates from the spiritual world. And they were all expansions of his mercy. They all possessed the same mercy as him. To help fulfill his mission. Amongst the associates of Nityananda Prabhu, the most prominent are the Dwadasa Gopals. The twelve Gopals. Twelve cowherd boy associates from Goloka Vrindavan who are always in the company of Krishna and Balaram. Kabikarnapul in Gauraganodashtapika describes how the cowherd boy Subahu appeared as Udharandat Thakur. He appeared in the year of 184, I'm sorry, 1481 in the town of Saptagram. Father is Shrikara, mother Bhadravati. Now, Saptagram was a place of bankers and gold merchants. Very wealthy community, but exceedingly materialistic. They are called the Suvarna Vanik caste. They had lots of money. Sometime before the advent of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, there was a very powerful personality. His name was Balal Sain. And he knew where to get money from. From the Saptagram community, he took big, big loans from a gory Sain. But what happened is Gauri Sain saw that Balal Sain was extravagantly misusing the money. So he decided, I will not give him any more loans. Balal Sain was infuriated. And he created a whole social conspiracy. Can you imagine if he had access to internet? <laughs> he made this whole conspiracy that the Suvarna Vaniks were outcasts. They were not Brahman Kshatriya Vaishas, hardly Sutras. And in doing so, he actually succeeded to publicly ostracize the whole community of Saptagram from any respectability. People looked down at them. They were taken away religious, prince, religious pri privileges. And they lived under that dark cloud for a long time. Udharanda Thakur, Subahu, the cowherd boy from Goloka, took birth in that family. Why? Vrindavan Das Thakur explains that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu especially wanted to teach the world that Krishna consciousness is not dependent on any external superficial identity. And to make his statement very, very strong, he proclaimed the Namacharya to be Haridas Thakur, who was born in an outcast family. Sri Adwaitacharya, who was the head of all the Brahmins, most honored and respected, 
when he performed the shraddha, all the greatest Brahmins would come to his house. It was a very prestigious event. I'm sure his wife, Sita Thakurani, made excellent prasad also. So, so everyone was coming. Many of all shraddhas, that is very prestigious to Adwaitacharyas. So high class scholars, pundits. And in front of all of them, he gave the highest honors. He worshipped Haridas Thakur. Powerful statement. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how he praised Haridas Thakur as if he had many, many mouths. And how he empowered him. So similarly, Udharanda Thakur, he was born in this uh, very, very materialistic uh, class of men who were just utterly disrespected from a religious or spiritual perspective. But his love for Krishna, because he's a Vaishnav, because of his attachment to Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda Prabhu, and the holy name, he not only delivered his entire caste, it is said that a Vaishnav who has a pure heart not only delivers his family, not only delivers his caste or hers, but purifies the entire world. Not only the entire world, but purifies the entire universe. That is how Krishna manifests through the heart of his devotees. So... <clears throat> From Padma Purana, Prabhupada often quotes, Arche Vishnu Shiladira Gurushu Naramatira Vaishnavi Jati Bhuti. That one who considers the deity to be made of stone or wood, the Guru to be an ordinary human being, the Vaishnav to belong to any particular caste or sect, the charanamrit of either a devotee's foot or the Lord's lotus feet, which has the power to sanctify the heart, to consider that ordinary water, to consider the name of Vishnu an ordinary sound vibration, or to consider that anyone could be equal to Vishnu, that person, Narakabhuti, his, his mentality is not only presently hellish, but it's destined toward the same place. So... <clears throat> Offenses to the holy name, offenses to Vaishnavas, are therefore taken very seriously by Krishna. There is sin or papa, and there is aparad. Sin is immoral, unethical activities. Or mistreating ordinary common people. But aparad is when we mistreat the Supreme Personality of Godhead or his devotees, the Vaishnavas. Now, nam aparad means negligent chanting. The holy name is so powerful 
that even if we chant with Nambasa, I'm sorry, Nambasa, even if we chant with Nambasa, negligently, not really understanding so well, still the power of the Holy Name can cleanse us of our sins and grant us liberation. If we don't commit offenses. And oftentimes, Ajamil is used as an example of such. Ajamil chanted. He didn't understand so much. He was so sinful. Even though he was covered by sins, when he chanted the holy name, he was freed from his sins. He gained liberation. Why? Because he wasn't committing offenses. There were no operads. Sins can easily be cleansed by the holy name. But we find repeated in the scriptures, operads, very difficult. When Durvasmuni offended Ambarish, neither Indra or Brahma or Shiva or even Vishnu himself could save him. Only when there was a sincere repentant begging forgiveness to Ambarish could he be forgiven. In fact, the scriptures tell us that not only Krishna will not save you from offenses to Vaishnavas. Even the Guru, the Guru cannot save you from offenses to Vaishnavas. He can instruct you, he can direct you, but if you commit those offenses, they're on you. And Krishna is going to take them very seriously. And if the guru is not very, very advanced, the disciples' offenses can even drag down the guru. That is how serious Vaishnava Parad is. And while we're on the subject, I'll divert. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to make a very strong statement in this regard. And he used his own beloved mother as an example. Shall I tell the story? In the house of Srivas, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, on rare occasions would manifest his, his supreme identity as the Lord. And so one day, he sat on the throne of Vishnu and picked up the Shalagram Shivas and put them on his laps and manifested his opulence as the Supreme Lord. Generally, Lord Chaitanya, he wanted to teach us how to be a devotee by his example. So he lived like a devotee. And if anyone called him the Lord, he would hold his ears, block them with his hands, cry out, Vishnu, Vishnu, never call the living entity the Lord. We are always his eternal servants. But sometimes amongst his closest associates, he would fulfill their desires by manifesting his forms of the Lord and grant them all benedictions. On this day, people were asking for benedictions. My father, he's acting very strange. <laughs> he's not very favorable to my Krishna consciousness. Please deliver him. Make him favorable. So be it. He will be favorable. So many benedictions. And Srivas Thakur, he asked for a benediction. Actually, he was just speaking out of affection. He said, my Lord, please give your mother, Sachi, Krishna Prem. The devotees were not expecting his reply. He said, my mother... I have no power to give her Krishna Prema. Out of the question, she has offended a Vaishnava. Huh? <laughs> it 
devotees. <laughs> Whatever happiness they had seeing the Lord and getting all blessings for themselves was finished. Because that's the nature of a devotee. More concerned with others than oneself. To the degree we're unselfish in our concern for other people to get Krishna's mercy, to that degree we're actually a Vaishnava. An envious person is willing, willing even to trample upon someone else for the purpose of prestige or power or influence or facilities. But a Vaishnava's greatest joy is to see others being empowered, to see others being blessed, to see others getting the mercy of Guru and Krishna. And that's actually a way we can analyze how we're making spiritual progress. When someone else is being empowered, when someone else is successful, if we feel joy in that, just feeling that joy is so dear to Krishna, he will bless us unlimitedly. But if we feel envious, Krishna will discard us. That is the disease. So all the devotees, they were broken hearted. Srivas Thakur said, how, how can you say like this? She's your mother. <laughs> you lived in her womb for so many months. She nourished you. And when you came out of her womb, she, with her own milk, she fed you. She sacrificed her whole life for you, only you. How could anyone speak like this about their own mother? Even if she may have made an offense, how could she make an offense? But even if she's made an offense, you have to forgive her. She's your mother. Lord Chaitanya said, no. She has made an aparad against Advaita. Only Advaita can forgive her if she wants Krishna Prema. So the devotees, along with Sachi Mata, called Advaitacharya. Advaitacharya came in. And Sachi Mata was hiding. She was hiding in a secret place, waiting for the opportune moment. And Srivas and the devotees said, please forgive um, forgive Sachi Mata, she offended you. And <laughs> the me? Forgive Sachi Mata? You want me to let her touch my feet? Impossible. Unthinkable. Can't even, can't even conceive of this. She's the mother of my Lord and my Master. She's the embodiment of devotion. I know who she is. She's, she's Mother Ganga. She's Mother Yashoda. She's Kosalya. She's Devaki. She's the eternal mother of the Supreme Lord. She's my worshipable deity in my heart. I should be taking dust from her lotus feet. The dust from her lotus feet will purify the entire universe. And as he was describing the glories of Sachimata, he went into such an ecstatic trance, he fell to the ground unconscious. Immediately, Sachimata ran out and put her head on, and put her head on his lotus feet. And he was not aware of any of it. He was, in, he was unconscious, glorifying Sachimata. And as Sachimata had his feet on her head, feeling his glories, she began to glorify Adoitacharya and she fell unconscious. So they were both laying there. And all the devotees were very happy. Haribo! 
They were very happy. And Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was sitting on the throne watching. And he was laughing. And then when Sachi Mata came up, he said, Now, Sachi Mata, I give you Krishna Prema. And then devotees were very happy. <laughs> Now one may wonder, what offense did Sachi Mata do? Shall I tell? <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's a very interactive class. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Vishwarup was the elder brother of Vishwambar, or Lord Chaitanya the son of Jagannath Mishra and Sachi. He had no inclination toward materialistic life. It is described that one day um, Jagannath Mishra brought Vishwarup to an assembly of learned Brahmin pundits. Now Vishwarup, he's actually not different than Nityananda Prabhu. He's an expansion. And he was so thoroughly learned in the scriptures. And he was an ocean of divine qualities. So humble, so gentle. Everyone loved him. But he was, he was just a boy. So Lord Shay, I mean, the Brahmins, they asked him, please tell us, what do you study? And he didn't really want to have so much of a dialogue with them because he saw they were quite mundane and they had no devotion to Krishna. <laughs> so he said, I study a little of everything. They, they were silent. And on the way home, Jagannath Mishra was very disturbed with Vishwaru. What kind of answer was that? That was not respecting the Brahmins. They asked you, why didn't you tell them the books that you studied? That's what they wanted to hear. What is this, a little of everything? That's no answer at all. Not only have you offended the Brahmins, but you have put a black spot on my good name. So Vishwaru went back to those Brahmins. He said, you asked a question? Whatever other questions you may have asked me, I'll answer them. So they began to talk. And then he said, shall I tell you what I understand? They said, yes. And he spoke some amazing philosophy. Amazing philosophy. They were spellbound. And then he said, actually, can any of you defeat what I have said? And they said, impossible. It's all based on logic and scripture and... He said, well, what I said is not what I really believe. <laughs> and then he systematically defeated everything he said previously. They said, he said, do you agree with this? They said, of course. How can anyone disagree with that? He said, well, actually, I don't even agree with it. <laughs> and then he defeated all of that stuff. And then he kept, he kept defeating his own arguments. And they were just sitting there totally silent. They, how could anyone be of such brilliance? And then in the end, he reestablished his original statement. <laughs> this was Vishwarup. But Vishwarup had no inclination whatsoever for idle gossip, prajalpa. Srila Prabhupada says about prajalpa. Prajalpa means discussing mundane subjects with no real um, purpose to please God. And especially fault finding and gossip. 
Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says, you can understand who is really a devotee of Nityananda Prabhu by the quality that they have no inclination to find faults with others. Now, <clears throat> so much gossip. And you know what gossip is about. You know, what this person has done and what that person has done and what everyone else is doing and all these things. Vishwaru couldn't tolerate listening to these things. And he was hearing people, even great scholars, pundits, they were describing the scriptures, but they had no devotion to Krishna. It was all just academic analysis of Sanskrit and competition of who can analyze more profoundly. It broke his heart. Even those who were teaching Bhagavad Gita. Nobody said anything about devotion to Krishna, which is the only purpose of Bhagavad Gita, to inspire devotion to Krishna. So Vishwarup, he found Advaita Charya and that Sangam, Srivas Thakur, they were constantly glorifying Krishna. At the time, very interesting, Advaita Charya was giving classes on the Yoga Vashishta. Now, Yoga Vashishta, or Vashishta Muni, is generally interpreted to be impersonal. But Sri Advaita Prabhu was describing every word of every sloka to glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that was just so brilliant. So Vishwarup, he just remained with Advaita Charya. He didn't want to see anything or anyone else. And he was there so much. And meanwhile, Sachi Mata is cooking nice prasad for him. Bengali prasad. <laughs> the best. And from the, from the hands of Sachi Mata, can you imagine Yashoda, Lord Chaitanya's mother, cooking prasad with pure love and devotion? How many of you would not come home on time for that? <laughs> You're all waiting for me to end class so you can get prasad <laughs> that the devotees cook today. I could sense it. Can you imagine if Sachi Mata personally cooked the prasad today? Twenty Sixth Second Avenue. Sri the Prabhupada personally cooked the whole feast every Sunday. He cooked prasad every day sometimes for devotees. With all his love and devotion, he would, he would, he would go out and buy the food. He would cut the vegetables. He would roll the dough. He would put it in the pots and put in the spices. He would prepare a wonderful feast. He would make kichoris and chutney and halava and rice and samosas. Malpura. And he would make puris and aromatic dal and all sorts of subjis and ladu <laughs> and always sweet rice, paramana. He would make all of those things with his own hands. And then he would personally offer it to Krishna. And then he would personally come down to the storefront and serve it with his own hands to all these crazy people. <laughs> some of them had long hair. Some of them were unbathed. Some of them were uh, un intoxicated with alcohol or, or ganja or 
this LSD. Some of them were coming in holding hands with their boyfriends and their girlfriends. And Prabhupada serving them. All this prasad. He would spend so many hours cooking. And the result? The Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> the hippies became happies by that prasad. From the hands of Srila Prabhupada. That is the power of his love. Now my question to you. How many of you would be eager to get prasad directly cooked and offered by Srila Prabhupada? I remember one time in the community I was staying in Vrindavan. Devotees wanted to learn how to make rasgulas. So they asked if Prabhupada would teach. So he said, yes, yes, I will teach. He said, get me some milk. They made the milk into curd, paneer, and then he kneaded it, and then he rolled it in balls, and then he, you know, he made, he, he boiled water and all of this, and then he put the paneer in the water, and somehow or other, each ball that he put in just, whoop, <laughs> within seconds, it just went, whoop, it just blew up. It was about 20, 20 pieces in there, and whoop, and everyone was going, whoop. And everyone who was watching was going, whoop. <laughs> it's amazing, unbelievable. And they're all just rolling around these big inflated balls of paneer curd. They're just rolling around in the water. Yes, it's so beautiful. And then he said, so now you just keep rolling them around for, a, for about five more minutes and then they'll be finished. And he gave the spoon to one devotee and left. As soon as that devotee put the spoon in the water, all the balls went... <laughs> How that happened was amazing. It was amazing. It went... And they're trying to make them go up again. And it just went... It came like raisins. Srila Prabhupada Ki So even when he's teaching us how to make rasgulas, he's teaching us how to be humble. Because that's actually the process of making rasgulas. You have to be humble. <laughs> because you're making it for Krishna. You're not making it for yourself. And Krishna accepts our devotion. And devotion is meaningless without humility. So Prabhupada was not only teaching us the physical science, but in the process he was teaching us the internal science. We cannot think ourselves the doer. We have to be humble. This is how the Rasgulas, it's not the sugar that makes them sweet for Krishna. It may be the sugar that makes them sweet for us, but for Krishna, it is the bhakti. Or as Prabhupada would say, Krishna does not accept the thing that is offered to him. Krishna accepts the purpose in which everything is offered. If we have that humble purpose to please him, then it is very sweet. So Sachimata, she would make a whole feast every day at noon for little Vishwambar, Lord Chaitanya, and, Vish, and Vishwarup. But Vishwarup wouldn't come home. So she would tell uh, Nimai that go to Adwaita's house. I know he's there. He doesn't go anywhere else. Go to Adwaita's house and tell him Prasad is ready. It's already offered to the deities. So Nehemiah would go, 
just a small boy. And he would come to the house and they would all be doing Harikata, talking about Krishna. Advaita Chaya would be constantly talking about Krishna. Srivas and Vishwarup, when he would speak about Krishna, he would just put everyone into a trance. And little Nimai would come and say, Brother, Mataji is calling. Time for Prasad. <laughs> and then he'd grab his brother by the cloth dhoti and pull him. And Vishwarup would go home. And everyone would be just staring at Nimai. Just staring. They couldn't take their eyes off him. They couldn't speak. In his presence, they couldn't even speak about Krishna. They were just so absorbed at looking at him. Sri Adoita Prabhu, Srivas, all these devotees were thinking, how is this? In my heart I am feeling the ecstasy of love of Krishna every time I time we see this child. But by his yoga maya potency, he hid the reality of his true identity. Anyways, Vishwarup. He was, when he heard that his parents were so worried that he was so much with the Dvaita Charya talking about Krishna, they were arranging for his marriage. So what did he do? Without saying a word to anyone, he left home and took sannyas, Shankar Aranya. Oh, Sachi Mata, her heart was broken. Her eldest son left. He was still a boy. <laughs> Living as a sannyasi in the forest. How can a mother tolerate such a thought? She was aggrieved. And in her mind, she was thinking, it's that adoita. He has influenced him to do this. He was always with Adoita. He influenced him to do this. But she knew that an Aparatu of Vaishnav is very dangerous. So therefore she did not say anything to anyone. She silently suffered. Her only solace was Vishwambar. Nimai was going out of his way to somehow or other give his mother happiness. She lived only for Nimai. After some time, Jagannath Mishra passed away from this world and returned to the spiritual world. Meanwhile, Nimai was living home he married Lakshmi Priya, went to Gaya, he came back, he was a devotee. And after he came back manifesting his devotee Leela, he was practically constantly at the house of Adoita Prabhu. <laughs> Such a much. <laughs> she cooked prasad. But you know, who was she gonna send to bring him home? He was hardly ever at home. He was always at Adoita Prabhu's house. So Sachi Mata became very, very much worried that Adoita Prabhu, he, he has already taken away one moon-like son, Vishwarup, and now he's about to take away my only other son. I'm helpless. I'm a widow. Nobody cares about me. I'm alone. All I have is my Nimai. Doesn't anyone hear my plea? Doesn't anyone feel my pain? And now he won't let go of my le- he won't let go of my youngest son. Everyone calls him a doita. Non-dual. But I say he's a doita. He's doita. Full of duplicity. 
Hare Krishna. That's all. In her utter anxiety and frustration and attachment and love for her son, she said that. And Lord Chaitanya knew she said that because he knows everything. He knows everything you say. He knows everything you think. Scary. (laughs) He knows everything you do. Even if you go to the climb to the top of Mount Everest, if you do some nonsense, Krishna knows. (laughs) Can't escape. So beautiful. Actually, she made no offense. She was just crying out out of pure love for her son. But Lord Chaitanya wanted to show the world that even if my own mother makes an aparad, I will not give her Krishna prema. So, yes, sins can implicate us in tremendous karma. But the holy name can deliver us from all those sins. But if we commit aparads to the Lord or his devotees, then Krishna will withdraw his mercy in the form of his name. But Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda do not accept offenses. Kali Yuga, Pavana. He's the deliverer in this age of Kali Yuga. Potita Pavana, Hetu. Tava Avatar. So, Bhakti Vinod Thakur and our Acharyas, Srila Prabhupada, they teach us that if we take shelter, of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda with faith. They could relieve us of not only our sins, our papa, but our offenses, aparads. And then, when we chant the holy names of Krishna, very quickly we can achieve the desired goal of ecstatic love. And for this reason, Srila Prabhupada, in the line of the Acharyas, taught us, before we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, we always chant the Panchatattva mantra. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadahara Sri Vasari Gaurat But it's not only chanting when we chant, Krishna reciprocates according to how we approach him, how we surrender. The proper way of chanting the holy name is to intensely absorb ourselves in the holy name and from our heart of hearts to take shelter. When we chant this Panchatattva Mantra in a mood of taking shelter of Lord Chaitanya, taking shelter of Lord Nityananda, Advaita Gadadhar Srivas, with faith, then they clear the path. They open up the road to love of God, which is available and accessible when we chant the Hare Krishna Mahamad. Golokera Premadana Harinam Sankirtan. This Maha Mantra has descended from Goloka Vrindavan, the spiritual world, to bring us back home to Goloka Vrindavan, the spiritual world.
to awaken the spiritual world within our hearts. That is the power of the holy name. If it is chanted properly with the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda Prabhu upon us. So, Lord Nityananda Prabhu, he empowered his expansions with his mercy to relieve sins, nullify offenses, and give ecstatic love of God. And today we are celebrating that great associate, Udarandat Thakur. Now we're getting back to today's class. <laughs> some, some break was there. It was like a commercial to advertise the holy name. <laughs> Now we get back to the story. The <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada explains his connection personally to Udharanda Thakur in the Adi Leela of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Would you like to hear? It's interactive. <laughs> so... Srila Prabhupada explains how in the province of Saptagram there were all these gold merchants. And by the mercy of Udharanda Thakur, they all became pure devotees of Krishna. We're going to discuss that too after some time, how that happened. Prabhupada explained that when the British wanted to establish Calcutta as a city and the capital of the British Empire in India, previously it was Kaligat. Still there's Kaligat, but it was named after that deity of Kali. But the British changed it to Calcutta. And <clears throat> in order to establish that city, the British called the gold merchants and bankers from Saptagram to set up their businesses and make their homes in Calcutta, which they did. Srila Prabhupada says that Half of Calcutta were the people of Saptagram at its initial stages. Then Srila Prabhupada tells how these gold merchants from Saptagram, during the Mughal rule, they were so dear because they were so qualified. And they did such great seva, service to society that the Mughal king gave them the title Malak. And Prabhupada says, in the Malak family, there's two branches, the seals and the days. And Prabhupada says that his father, from his paternal side, the descendants were from Adi Saptagram, and, therefore, and their surname is Day. And Prabhupada said, because of this, all the days of the Calcutta and area, they would regularly go to Saptagram to worship the deity of Udharanda Thakur. Because not only is he of their same line, but he's such a great empowered devotee of Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya. So from his childhood, Prabhupada's father would take him and mother to, um, to that place. It's up the ground. And Prabhupada says there's a deity, the very same deity that Udharanda Thakur worshipped. 
Sadbuja, six-armed form of Lord Chaitanya, carrying the bow and arrow of Ram, playing the flute of Krishna, and holding the danda and kamandalu of Lord Chaitanya. And to the right side of Sadbuja is Lord Nityananda, to the left, Gadadhar Pandit. And there's also deity of Radha Govinda, and below is a f- f- photograph, a painting of Udarandat Thakur. And Prabhupada said, there's a very cool, shady courtyard due to a vine, a Madhavi vine, which just goes over the whole, shades the whole area. And Prabhupada said, when Lord Nityananda came to visit Udarandat Thakur, he planted that Madhavi vine. And it's, its descendants is still giving shade to all the people there. Now I'm going to take another break from the main story for a very nice reason. Recently, with Giriraj Swami Maharaj, we went to Calcutta to see the places of Srila Prabhupada's early life. How many of you have gone to these places? Please raise your hands. Okay. First we went to the Radha Govinda Temple. Radha Govinda Temple. Beautiful deities of Radha Govinda. Over 200 years old. The Pujari told us that one it's in the Malak compound. So Prabhupada was from the Malak dynasty, a day. And one very, very great devotee lady, she had a dream of Krishna and Radharani. And from that dream, she made deities. And Krishna is very unusual. I'm sorry, Krishna is very unusual. Radharani is standing just like Krishna in a threefold bending form with her, with her feet crossed just like Krishna's are. Very beautiful deities. From Prabhupada's earliest childhood, his father would take them, take Prabhupada there to worship Radha Govinda. His house on Harrison Road is just about a block away from that temple, a couple blocks at the most. So Prabhupada would come there, even as a small child, just to look at the deities and worship the deities. Let's see his parents worship Radha Govinda. He loved Radha Govinda. And the Rathiatra, the Puj. The Pujaris and the very elder people of the Malak compound there, they tell how when Prabhupada would perform his Rathayacha as a small child, he would, he would get his father and mother and everyone to help him make a little chariot for Jagannath. And he was so happy. He loved Jagannath. It was all his own initiative, little boy. And they would all decorate with flowers. And he'd pull it, pull the chariot, and he would be distributing prasad and having Nam Sankirtan. And that Ratayacha would be through the lanes, and ultimately it would go around the temple of Radha Govinda and in the courtyard. And then he would have his little festival. Under this inspiration, my dear God, Brother Nara Narayan Prabhu, at New Vrindavan, he cut down, or somebody cut down some trees, and he carved beautiful, very large Jagannath deities. And they're still there on the altar. And also he helped make chariots for Jagannath. Prabhupada called him Nara Narayan Vishwakarma because he, <laughs> because he was such a good carpenter and designer and making so many things. He would make chariots for Jagannath. He would make deities of Jagannath. But it all started in the Radha Govinda temple where Prabhupada, as a little boy, would have his Ratiyatras. Then we went 
to Prabhupada's school, his first school. Do you remember the name of that school? Motilal Seal Free School. Yes? It's the same original building. And we were looking from the outside, and we really wanted to go inside. Because you can see by looking at it, it's exactly the same as when Prabhupada was there. It's just a very old, British-built building. So then some of the uh, superintendents, principal and uh, managers of the school, they came and greeted us, and they said, we'll let you in, you could come in. And they said, actually, the school, it has never been, it has been kept in good condition, but it's never been changed. It's the same way it's been for 100 years. Anyway, so we were looking in the classrooms, these little wooden desks, you know, those long desks, just picturing little, little Srila Prabhupada doing his studies there, <laughs> meditating on Krishna. And then they told us something that was very sweet. Should I tell? Thank you. They told us that several devotees were coming because they wanted to see the place, because they said that Srila Prabhupada, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, he used to go to school here. So the principal was wondering, because you know how India is, you know, the Pandavas were here, and the Pandavas, anywhere you want to build a temple, you say the Pandavas came here. <laughs> So they wanted to know whether Prabhupada actually did go to school there. So they went to the trustees. And the trustees in some storeroom, they have all the old books of the entry records for all the students. Now this is, in the, this is around 2004 or something, 2005 they did this. They went all the way, they just dug through all these books back down to 1901. <laughs> That's like 105 years. Right? They kept all the records. And they looked in the book. And there was all these names. And there was Abhay Charan Day. <laughs> Showing his address on Harrison Road. At Evol. They didn't show us, but they told us. <laughs> and then we went to Prabhupada's birthplace. Now, whatever I tell you today, please promise you won't tell anyone. <laughs> do you promise? Okay. Because if you do, I'll get in trouble. <laughs> Is it possible to keep a secret with all these people? <laughs> then I won't tell you. Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> Iskan has a nice piece of land there. And you see, the tradition in Bengal is when a child is born, Prabhupada's family was living on Harrison Road near the Radha Govinda Temple, but his mother's home was near the Kali Ghat. And that was her ancestral home. So when a mother's pregnant, she goes and gives birth and stays for about a month in her own family's home. So we went there. And um, we were so happy. But then Giriraj Swami took me aside. He said, the exact spot where Prabhupada took birth, this person I'm with knows where it is. But he can't take us because it's a secret. I said, why is it a secret? Because some devotees want to buy that land. And if they find out that we know that that's the place that Prabhupada took birth. In fact, 
They don't even know it's the place Prabhupada took birth. If they find out that this is the place that Prabhupada took birth, the prices will go so high. So we can't let them know that that's the place Prabhupada took birth. Because Prabhupada says he was born under a jackfruit tree. That's the place of this ancient jackfruit tree. So the devotee said, I'll take only the two of you, but nobody else. Everybody, there was only about six or seven. Of us. The others cannot go because we cannot give anybody the impression that Prabhupada was born here. Should I continue? So we went. We weren't so indiscriminate, you know, we're sannyasis. <laughs> we're not so discreet. We, so we go and we're walking like... It's like we're just going shopping, you know, going to buy some groceries. And we're walking like this and we get near the jackfruit tree. And some little girls are playing with balls. Little girls just playing. They're maybe about four years old. They're just smiling. And then they looked at us and they pointed to the jackfruit tree and said, Prabhupada was born there. We, we pretended like we didn't hear them, you know. <laughs> so then we get closer to the jackfruit tree. And it's in a little tiny lane with houses almost crushed all around it. And just the house right in front of it, which means literally about six feet away is this house. This lady comes out of the little house with a baby in her arms. And she smiles at us and says, Jackfruit tree, Prabhupada born under Jackfruit tree. <laughs> so much for keeping it a secret. <laughs> Every little girl in the neighborhood knows it. The mother knows it. The, the owners of the property. Anyways, we, we worship the Jackfruit tree. It was very nice. And then one of Prabhupada's mother's nephews, very old man now, from mother's side, um, great nephew perhaps, he told us all about, he said he, when he was a very little boy, he would massage Prabhupada. He massage Prabhupada and after massaging Prabhupada, he would ask for money. <laughs> and Prabhupada would always give him prasad. He said, this is better than money. So he was very happy. He told us that story. And then he told us across the street from this little area, it used to be one compound, now it's divided into so many little plots, where Prabhupada took birth, his mother's ancestral home, there's a deity of Radha Madan Mohan. And everyone, it was tradition of the family that whenever a lady gave birth to a child, she would, for the Shasti Puja, they would always perform it in the Radha Madan Mohan temple. And the first place, it's the tradition of the family. The lady is in the house, the mother who gives birth for some days. And the first she leaves the house is always to go to the Madan Mohan temple to offer the child to the deity of Madan Mohan. So the descendant of Prabhupada's mother and father brought us to that Madan Mohan temple. And as we were looking at these beautiful deities, Kiriraj Swami and myself were thinking that when Prabhupada was an infant child, just weeks old, these were the first deities 
that he saw in his life. Very special. So now we'll get back to the story. (laughs) Srila Prabhupada explains how his family from Calcutta, the days were very, very specially connected to Udharanda Thakur and Saptagram. And then Srila Prabhupada says in 1967, the trustees of the Radha Govinda Temple in Calcutta, I'm sorry, the trustees of Udharanda Thakur's temple in Saptagram, they invited Prabhupada to come. Because could you imagine how proud they were? Here's a descendant of Saptagram, who is now the world Acharya, spreading Krishna consciousness all over the world, who used to come to our temple when he was a little boy with his father and mother. So Prabhupada says in 1967, Prabhupada came with some of his American disciples to visit Udharanda Thakur's temple there. So we know in Jagannath Puri, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in a confidential place, he instructed Nityananda Prabhu to go to Bengal to distribute love of God through Harinam Sankirtan. Nityananda Prabhu took that order as his life and soul. And along with his most intimate associates, Abhiram Thakur, Gadadhar Das, Dhananjai Pandit, Purandar Das, he went to Bengal to First they went to Panihati, where they had an amazing kirtan. We were describing this in the Yatra. It was such an empowered kirtan that everyone forgot to eat, sleep, or drink anything for three months. They just chanted the holy name. but I will end soon because I know you're hungry and thirsty. (laughs) And my lecture is probably making you very tired also. So, from Panihati, he visited the house of Gadadhar Das. And then from there, Nityananda Prabhu and his associates went to Karadaha which later on became his base, his headquarters for preaching. It's near the bank of the Ganga. And there was a devotee named Purandar. And this Purandar Pandit, he was so ecstatic to see Nityananda Prabhu. He was one of the associates. He climbed a tree and roared like a lion. And then there was another devotee named Chaitanya Das. And Chaitanya Bhagavat describes the nature of this Chaitanya Das. Sometimes called, this Chaitanya Das from Karadaha, he was absolutely fearless. When he would chant the holy names, he would become so merciful. He would just run into the forest Nityananda Prabhu was watching. He would just run into the forest and he'd just start chasing after wild animals. He saw a tiger, Bengali tiger, (laughs) the biggest tigers in the world. And he would see that tiger and jump on his back and slap his face. (laughs) And all the tiger could do is just, just... Offer obeisances. <laughs> he, he'd ride on the tiger doing Nam Sankirtan. Other times he'd see a big python. He'd just grab it, sit down, put it on his lap and play with it like a toy. Other times, if he wanted to chant in a quiet place, he'd go to the river Ganges and go underwater, completely submerged, or in a lake or a river, 
he'd go underwater sometimes for three to five days without coming up. He'd just be absorbed in chanting the holy name. Now, you may think that this is impossible. But it's impossible for this to be impossible. Because what is it that the Lord cannot do? And what is it that the Lord cannot empower his eternal associates from the spiritual world to do when they come to this world? Then Lord Nityananda Prabhu brought the devotees to Saptagram. First they went to the home of Udarandat Thakur. Udaranda Thakur is talk, called by our Acharyas Parama Parama Patita Pavana. That means he is the deliverer of the most fallen amongst the most fallen. Supremely merciful to the most fallen. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says he was the greatest Bhagavat, the greatest of the Vaishnavas, Udaranda Thakur. Because nobody could conceive that these very materialistic merchants of gold, they're so materialistic, so attached, so working like asses day and night just for money. How could they become devotees? And besides that, at the time, we explained previously in our talk, they were practically outcasts. They were socially ostracized, both on a social and religious level. They had no standing. They were considered the most difficult people to reach because their minds were constantly absorbed in pounds, shillings, and pence, as they say in England. Udaranda Thakur he transformed the entire town of Saptagram just by his influence alone into pure Vaishnavas. So Nityananda Prabhu came there and at the house of Udaranda Thakur, Udaranda Thakur worshipped Nityananda Prabhu with so much love, washed his feet, offered him a nice sitting place, offered him garlands, puja, cooked a beautiful feast of Mahaprasad, offered it to Nityananda Prabhu, worshipped him with love. Nityananda Prabhu was so happy with Udaranda Thakur, he decided, I will give the highest prema ras to the whole town because of you. Because of your love and devotion, I will give the highest prema to everyone here. Then Nityananda Prabhu assembled his devotees to perform Nam Sankirtan. Nityananda Prabhu was in ecstasy. All the devotees were in ecstasy. Who cares if they're all materialistic people absorbed in materialistic, selfish activities? doesn't matter. Nityananda Prabhu led that Nam Sankirtan party to every single house in Saptagram. And each householder came out of their house and when they would see Nityananda Prabhu dancing and hear his chanting of the holy names and see all the Vaishnavas, they became attracted. They joined the kirtan. And it went to the next house. Every house the kirtan was growing more, 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 more. They went through every lane, every street, every marketplace, every home in Nadi in Saptagram. And there was a tumultuous roar in all directions of devotees in ecstatic love crying out the holy name. (laughs) 
Vrindavan Das Thakur explained, nobody had seen any kirtan like this since the kirtans in Navadweep. Many years before. And he explains that this kirtan was so full of love, was so unbelievable that it's impossible to describe the glories of this kirtan even in 1,000 years. But he gives an example of one thing that happened. As thousands and thousands and thousands of people were chanting, this whole cast of people all became pure devotees, totally detached from any selfish desires, no ego. One Muslim man who was, like most, eating meat, he happened to see this kirtan. And he saw Lord Nityananda Thuru dancing. And tears of love of God poured from his eyes. His limbs trembled. He got all choked up, raised his arms, and started chanting the holy names, dancing in ecstasy. And there was a Brahmin who happened to see this. And that Brahman condemned himself that I don't even have a single particle of love of God and absorption in, a, in, 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 in spiritual life. I have no love for Krishna. I have no love for Vishnu. Compared to this Muslim man, by the mercy of Lord Nityananda, whose mercy was coming by the prayers of Udharanda Thakur. When great devotees pray for our deliverance, the Lord gives special attention to shower His mercy upon us. This was the great Nam Sankirtan, historical Sankirtan in Saptagram. During our yatra, how many of you visited Shaptagram? It's a very ancient place. It is called Saptagram because the seven great rishis performed their tapasya there. And there's three rivers called the Triveni, the Ganga, the Jamuna, the Saraswati, that is right there in Saptagram especially the river Ganges, is manifested today. And in the Saptagram area, there is Krishnapur, the birthplace of Raghunath Das Goswami, Chandpur, the birthplace of Kalidas, who took a vow to get to obtain the remnants of every single Vaishnava in the whole Bengal. And Nityananda Prabhu was really expanding the number of Vaishnavas too. <laughs> but he succeeded. Somehow or other, he got the remnants of every Vaishnava in Bengal. He got their food remnants, he got the dust of their feet. sometimes through very indirect methods. And because he had so much faith in the dust of the feet of Vaishnavas, Lord Nityananda Prabhu, or Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Puri gave him a benediction that nobody else had ever got, except his most intimate associates. But that is for another class. That is also the place Haridas Thakur performed his lecture on the glories of the holy name in Jandpur. So it's a very, very special place. We learn from this story of Udharanda Thakur so many beautiful messages. The mercy of the Lord and how it manifests through his devotees. And that great descendant of the families of Buddha and Thakur, Srila Prabhupada, 
how the mercy of the Lord has manifested to the world through his compassion. It is our only qualification. Without discrimination. Srila Prabhupada, literally, he fought for the rights of his devotees. He fought for the rights of everyone to get Krishna Prema. When he came to the West and he made these, by social system, Malechas and Yavanas devotees, it's the most difficult thing to do. Very, very difficult. In fact, his god brothers, many of them, Sumati Mararji, all these people who were very devout devotees of Krishna, they told him it's impossible. You can't do it. These people are eating meat since birth and they're addicted to all sinful activities and there's no culture. How can you make them Vaishnavas? It's impossible. What to speak of Brahmin Vaishnavas, Sannyasi Vaishnavas, out of the question. Can't do it. But Srila Prabhupada was told by his Guru Maharaj. I was just listening to a tape where Prabhupada said his Guru Maharaj specifically ordered him to spread Lord Chaitanya's teachings in the Western world. And Prabhupada understood, if I can spread it in the Western world and bring Western people back to India, then it will spread in India too. So Prabhupada had faith. That's all he had. He had a box of books, and he had faith in the words of his Guru Maharaj and the holy name of Krishna. And heart attacks and seasickness and living in the Bowery and death threats and all those austerities. And somehow or other, by his unflinching determination, his un- inconceivable sacrifice, he transformed the hearts of so many people. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling, no meat-eating, chanting 16 rounds, giving up all material pursuits, and 24 hours a day serving Krishna. Amazing. But then, he was criticized for that. You're giving Brahminical initiation to Malechas? This is, this is an offense. And one very uh, renowned Vaishnav, when he heard about this, he very much minimized Prabhupada. He said, so what? What has he done? He's made some hippies chant Hare Krishna. So what? And we're after the Brahmins. We're after the grapes. So he made some hippies devotees. When Prabhupada heard he said that, he considered that a great glorification. <laughs> that was Nityananda Prabhu's thing. He went to Saptagram to make the most materialistic outcast people devotees. Jagai and Madhai. Now we'd like to hear for a, f- for a few moments from Narayan Prabhu something about the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Coming as I do from that land of the Malacha, having taken shelter of Srila Prabhupada's lotus feet in that land, I had no qualification. I had no dream of qualification. I had looked here and there for answers, and I was pulled up by Srila Prabhupada. How? 
because he came to me. In 1969, I'm sitting in the first temple of Los Angeles, which is not where it is today, and a young man is sitting there and raises his hands. He says, Swamiji, we did not call him Prabhupada yet. He says, Swamiji, uh, may I ask you a question? And Prabhupada said, yes. <laughs> and the young man said, I want to go to India and find a guru. Is that a good idea that I should do that? And Prabhupada said, why you should come to India to find guru? Guru has come here. So that is the descendancy from the Pancharatra of Narada Muni. That coming down is the guru. Narada showed this time and time again, that he came down and delivered uh, 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 Magari. He came down, he delivered Valmiki. And in that way, even Valmiki tied him up. He came down and delivered. So we did not have to go. So Prabhupada came to me. But now in that same place in 1969, in that same temple, on the disappearance day of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, as Maharaj was speaking, I could not help but remember this pastime of the taste of Prabhupada Prasad that he cooked personally. And this was a very strange situation. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, disappearance day. Prabhupada kept to himself in the kitchen. And there was a pot this size, about this size. And he cooked kitri, not kitri, yeah, kitri, more or less kitri, very mild from Erdo. And from the Erdo kitri, he cooked about that much. In the pot was like this, and he cooked about that much. And we knew there was going to be a feast for the disappearance day of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. So we all were ready, full of American enthusiasm, to eat this feast. On top of it, we also knew that Srila Prabhupada had cooked it. So we all came in to Prasadam Hall, 25, 30 of us, maybe even 40 of us. A lot of very large, hungry American Malachas like me, my fellow Malachas. And we sat down for this feast, and everyone was sitting. There was this pot in the middle of the room. Usually Prabhupada would spend time with us, he would eat with us like that. But no, this time, his only manifestation of Srila Prabhupada was the pot sitting in the middle of the room. So we all sat there, not knowing what to think. And someone came and took our plate and put, like that, because there wasn't very much. We put, everybody had a taste like that on their plate. And we were saying, well, this will do for starters. And we thought, well, you know, we're very offensive-minded people. We did not catch the subtlety until we touched it with our hands. When we touched it with our hands, we knew something had changed in the universe. In the universe, at that moment, the change was taking place it round that pot in Los Angeles, California. We taste, it, touched it. Everyone was looking at everyone, but no one could see anyone. They reached and they pick up this little prasad. So far, it is held like a sacred thing. We just, we had no talent, no qualification, but we felt it. It was like a powerful feeling. We put it in our mouths. When we put it in our mouths, our consciousness, which is, you know, covering every territory and looking and thinking and evaluating and wanting things, it went shh, 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 Not a single soul could see another single soul. We just saw grains of erdo in our hand. We tasted. And we reached down and we took another taste. And we reached down and took another taste. Practically, there was very little to taste. It was just a few little bites. Then all at once, everybody looked up like this when it was gone. And they saw the pot in the middle of the room. And we all crawled forwards <laughs> towards the pot. This is no exaggeration. We all crawled forward towards the pot. And we looked at the pot inside. And there really wasn't anything left. Just some pieces were stuck there and there. And we reached inside the pot. This is very offensive. We never ate out of the cooking pots. 
But no one was thinking, therefore, was there any sin committed? <laughs> we reached inside the pot, one grain, another grain, like that. And ev- nobody crowded anyone. Forty hands, 30, 40 hands came. <laughs> With plenty of room to pick up one, two grains. The taste was unimaginable. There was hardly any spice. Ghee, mung, I mean, erdo, a little white globs of erdo, tasting. And as we tasted it, essentially, we surrendered to everything. We surrendered to Krishna. We surrendered to Prabhupada. We surrendered to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. On top of that, we felt, we could feel or get, not by our intelligence, but by the taste, his separation from his spiritual master. We could feel these vipralamba, how much he was missing his Guru Maharaj. And there was no other feast. There was no other meal that day. And we went to bed that night full without having really eaten any quantity. And I took one more piece and I took it out and I reached in my pocket. I had a piece of paper and I put it in. And I put it in my pocket. And you know what? Prabhu's, I beg you to understand this. I still have it. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much, Maharaj. So I'm saying this in order to, that Maharaj was talking about <clears throat> the taste, how to Prabhupada's cooking. And I could never imagine. I've tasted so many things he cooked in different places. But this is all I can remember is this one taste. Hare Krishna. You not only have that, but you have our hearts with us. Thank you very much, Narayana. Let us express our gratitude to him by chanting Harivo.